Good afternoon, a very warm welcome to all of you. My name is Joyce O'Connor. I chair the digital group here at the IIEA. I hope you are keeping well and staying safe. I'm delighted to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Bruno Lindeberg, founder and director general of the Center on Regulation in Europe and chair of the EU Observatory on the Online Platform Economy, who will speak on a very timely and important topic regulating the online economy towards a global digital deal. You are very welcome, Bruno, and we're really pleased that you're taking time to be with us today. Thank you very much. Bruno will speak to us for about 20 to 25 minutes or so, and then we'll go to your audience for our questions. You can join us in discussion using the Q&A function at the right hand of your screen. Please send your questions in during Bruno's presentation. And I'd really appreciate it if you give your name and affiliation when you're asking questions. Thank you so much for doing that. Please join us on Twitter at Twitter handle at IIEA. As you know, the presentation and the Q&A are on the record. It goes without saying that digital technologies are impacting on our lives on a daily basis. Technology can and does help us redefine problems, create solution and helps us reinvent the future. But governments are increasingly scrutinizing tech companies that become critical infrastructure for billions of people and businesses to communicate, shop and learn about the world. Could the result be that technology sector behaves more like banking, telecom, telecommunications and healthcare industries of such size and importance that they are subject to more government regulation and supervision? Will 2021 be the year of regulation for the tech joints? Bruno's presentation is timely. He will discuss the possible features of a global digital deal involving industry, governments and regulatory authorities outlining the rights and obligations of all parties. He will place these issues in the context of an assessment of the online platform economy and of the recent landmark European Commission regulatory proposals, such as the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Service Act. Dr. Bruno Liedeberg has a distinguished career to date. He started his career early on in the European Commission with the WTO uh, negotiations before joining the private office of the former European Commission, or Jacques Delors. He was also president and vice president of the Scientific Council of the Foundation for European Progressive Studies from 2012 to 2017. He was professor at the Solvay uh, Business School of Economics and Management for many years. Bruno is currently chair of the EU Observatory on Online Platform Economy, which was established to advise the European Commission on policy making. He is the founder which he, of and director general of the Centre on Regulation in Europe, a think tank which brings together regulators, corporations and university research centres in order to promote better regulation in Europe. Bruno, you're very welcome, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joyce. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to, to your viewers. Um, I'm very happy to, for, for this invitation to, to talk to the, to the Institute for International and, and European Affairs. I think it's a honor for me to, to talk on, on, on the platform of your, of your prestigious institution. And I'm talking about this afternoon on, on a topic which, as you mentioned, Joyce, uh, has been a, a front page topic for, for some time now. And I see many reasons for that. The first one you mentioned it, it's, it's that the internet and the online economy in particular have transformed our lives, the way we interact, the way we work, the way we shop, we get educated, we get entertained and many other aspects. Digitalization has also radically transformed our economies and the pandemic has in the last 12 months led to an additional quantum leap in our society's digitalization. I'm convinced, however, that the reason why our papers or newspapers talk every day about the role of the online platforms and about regulating the online economy 
is also because of a number of fundamental issues which are related to the uh, activities of the so-called big tech. That's why in my comments this afternoon, I'd like to discuss first, what are the issues? Second, what should, but also what, what could be done to address them in, in an appropriate way. And because many of the online platforms are present in a large majority of countries in the world, and because issues around the internet are global issues that have even acquired a geopolitical dimension, I would also like to discuss in the third part of my comments whether global regulatory solutions could be envisaged, whether a global digital deal would be desirable, and if so, on what conditions, and what could be the features of such a deal. Before I start, I'll just make a, a disclaimer. You, you, you rightly mentioned, Joyce, that in addition to my position at CERN, uh, I'm the, the, the chair of the expert group for the EU Observatory on the Online Platform Economy. Uh, that is correct. I will, however, be talking this afternoon in my own name, and my statements will not commit either the European Commission or the EU Observatory or the Observatory's expert group. So let's start with a few remarks on what are, from, from my perspective, the main benefits and, and, and challenges of the online platform economy for consumers, for business users, for citizens. You know, the platforms are pervasive in people's lives and, and they are a hot topic because their impact is, is tangible for each of us. And it's communicable with real life examples. That is why to, to organize my remarks on the benefits and challenges, I thought of a spaghetti Western film directed by Sergio Leone in the mid sixties. <laughs> You've clearly seen the movies, Joyce, so you remember it. It was called The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. <laughs> and in the online platform economy, the good is about the platform's role in innovation convenience, accessibility. We hear too often, at least to my taste, that platforms threaten innovation. On the contrary, platforms have been playing and continue to play a crucial role in generating innovative services, benefiting billions of users all over the globe. And perhaps the most universal among these benefits are the convenience and accessibility which platforms provide. Their services have opened up a world of convenience for consumers with connectivity and digitalized access to goods and services from any place the user finds her or himself. In, in addition, the online platforms have massively expanded opportunities for SMEs publishers and others to reach new audiences and markets, which by the way, can be both good and bad. And finally, let's also acknowledge the important fact that digital services have allowed the economy and the wider society to keep functioning throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Turning that to the bad, <laughs> if we just look at economic regulation and, and competition law related issues. The bad would encompass abuse of, abuse of market power, lack of contestability, unlevel playing field, lack of transparency, killer acquisitions and differentiated treatment. And I think it would include, we could also include their issues related to data, sharing, portability, and the relationship between data and, and targeted advertising. And then we come to the ugly. And in this category, I would include first the fact that some platforms have not ensured that their users' data are properly handled, that they are too often a conduit for illegal and harmful content, whether it is disinformation, hate speech, political propaganda, 
or even in due meddling in elections. And I could also refer, for instance, to the uh, unfortunate uh, events in, in the capital, I'm referring to the riots just a few months ago. And I'd add an element which somehow limits the benefits of the innovative character of the platform services. And that is their role in users addiction to their services. And this is essentially triggered by the fight for our attention, which is one of the major characteristics of many platforms business models. And I could also include their broader issues such as tax and labor relations and conditions of, of what is being referred to as the, as the gig economy. But to encapsulate all that, I would say that in a nutshell, the concerns of citizens, business users, and governments about platforms are fundamentally related to their distrust of the platform's activities, to their perception, sometimes diffuse, sometimes explicit, of a loss of autonomy, and third, to the unfairness of the situation they feel they are being faced with in their relation with the platforms. And this leads us to wonder then, you know, to have questions such as, what do platforms do with my personal data? Mm -hmm. Why do I get some messages and not others? And, and even more fundamentally, uh, are platforms gradually governing the public space? So against that background, let's move to the, the second part of my comments. And these are about the question, what's driving? What is the regulatory drive around online platforms? And I think that part of the answer lies in the needs to provide clarity for businesses, for the courts, etc., and also to assign clear mandates and clear responsibilities. But more fundamentally, following up what I just developed, I'd say that the regulation of online platforms is, is driven by the needs felt in, in many parts of our societies to take back control and to restore trust, autonomy, and also fairness. And in addition, it, it, it's clear that it's also a concrete way for democratically elected politicians to, to address their, their citizens' concerns. And as such, these drivers bring opportunities, clarity of objective and messaging around why regulation is being introduced, but they also do generate risks. I would mention the risk to fall in the trap of announcement politics, mm -hmm. but also the risk to, to regulate for the sake of regulating without sufficiently thinking through unintended consequences. Before discussing the various regulatory proposals and actions which are developing in the EU, or at least some of those proposals in the EU and elsewhere, I, I just like to, to remind you that the platforms are, are not a cohesive, homogeneous category. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look, when you compare, for instance, marketplaces, e-commerce websites, to social media, it's clear that they're not the same. And clearly, this has and should have significant implications, both in terms of the nature, but also the level of uh, regulatory issues to be addressed. And the lack of cohesiveness of the platforms is, I think, also illustrated by the fact that until now, the GAFA, as they called, had largely been united in their opposition to most, form, most forms of, uh, of regulation. And now we see that that unity is splintering mm. and regulation is gradually becoming part of the competitive process as it is the case in, in other industries. 
And I'd even go further and say that the heterogeneity of the platform economy is highlighted by, by the conflict and, and, and the rather strong words which have been recently exchanged via the media between the CEOs of Apple and Facebook. And I think that their conflict is very significant precisely because it spotlights something broader than just the fights between competitors. I think that what is really at stake are fundamentally different visions of the internet and of the future of the internet. If you take on the one hand, Facebook and, and perhaps to a large extent also Google, their business model is about capturing and monetizing users' attention on every possible device and platform. Now, if you look at the, the, the Apple's model, it's very different. It's to draw users to its own hardware-centric universe. And then if you see that, you understand why Apple can emphasize it, its privacy focus and mm -hmm. highlight the opposition of that model with a vision of, uh, shall I say, more radical openness, where privacy protection would not anymore be a social norm because that's basically where, what was the, the starting point of, of some of the, the big platforms uh, users, if I think of, of Facebook. And, and, and this is the rationale for, for free services supported by targeted advertising. So coming back to the, uh, the regulatory response there the are three main broad series of issues which are addressed by, by governments and, and regulators. The first one is everything around competitive markets reform. And there the objective is to ensure fair and open digital markets, which are kept contestable. And by that, I mean, which, which allow entry to existing new and uh, emerging players. Then you have a second category, which are the rules on e-commerce and online content, and more broadly on, on the regulation of the platform's conduct. Until now, it's, it's a fact that we have largely relied upon self-regulation by the platforms themselves to do this. And we've come to the conclusion that this may not necessarily be the answer. And this is why regulators come up with rules to secure, just to take an example, online, online platforms responsibility in, uh, uh, in content governance. And by that, we mean that they quickly and, and proactively detect, remove, and prevent the reappearance of, of illegal and to some extent also harmful content online. And then you have a third category of, of issues which are being regulated. And I would say that these fall within the category of, uh, of consumer protection regulation. And this is designed to, to protect users who interact with dominant platform and dominant platforms and, and, and privacy legislation is, is part of that category. It aims ensuring that the platforms guarantee confidentiality and, and security for, for the huge amounts of users' data that they have access to. And Mutatis Mutandis, the, the platform to business regulation, pursues similar objectives, but in this case, to protect SMEs. So, Joyce, regulators are circling. They're circling all over the world. And the EU is in the lead. Mm -hmm. because of, I would say, sensitivities around the technology's impact on fundamental values. And building on the digital single market rules, the centerpiece offerings from, from the current Commission College are two proposals which have been published last December, last December and uh, they uh, deal with, on the one hand, a digital, they consist in a digital markets act and 
uh, on the other hand, a digital services act. But both pieces are driven by the same rationale, which Executive Vice President Margaret Vestager clearly outlines. With size and power comes responsibility, she said. And I think this is fundamental. Both sets of proposals aim to ensure that platforms behave fairly and create a competitive and safe environment for their consumer and business customers. And I'll just say a few words on each of the two proposals. The, the DMA in particular represents a, a new way of regulating in the, in the digital sector uh, as it looks to, to level the playing field with, with an ex-ante approach or regulating in anticipation of any further issues, basically. And, and with this, the, the commission is, is reacting to a, a rather long-standing concern that uh, the competition law framework is too slow to keep up with the fast pace of innovation in the online economy. And then you have the DSA. And the DSA proposal focuses on plugging in legal gaps to provide certainty across the e-commerce and contents part of the, the platform economy. The commission believes a common set of rules on intermediaries, obligations, and accountability across the single market will open up new opportunities to provide digital services across borders while ensuring a high level of protection to all users, no matter where they live in the EU. And protection encompasses questions of security, quality, safety, trust, as well as fair competition. So basically, we could say that the DSA aims at enhancing platforms liability and also rebalancing relations between users and platforms in favor of users. Personally, I, mean, I believe in making things simple. Mm. What is illegal offline should also be illegal online. Mm. And uh, I would add that clearly to find appropriate solution to, to all the issues at stakes, this will require determined will and determined action on behalf of all parties involved. And we may come back to that. I said we have... Uh, the, and we have also other initiatives uh, on data governance, uh, democracy, audiovisual media services, which complete the two pieces that I mentioned. And all these proposals aim to, to further embed a coherent value-based approach to the uh, platform economy. So that's for the EU. And I said it's certainly in the lead for now, but member states are pushing and they're pushing in the, in the unions back through autonomous action. You see that in France, you see that in Germany, and, and uh, clearly uh, this is something which uh, the commission has to take care of uh, to make sure that uh, all those different uh, initiatives will fit, clearly fit in the, the EU framework. But Europe is not the only one. The other countries are catching up and they're catching up fast. Uh, the UK, has got its own approach and I could come back to it if, if, if people want in the, in the Q&A. Uh, I would say a few words though on the, on the US. In the US, you have investigations going on by 48 state attorney generals, by the Federal Trade Commission, by the Justice Department. You have in addition more than 20 proposals to update section 230, which has surfaced on the Hill originated from, from both, side, both sides of the aisle. Section 230 is the law that protects online platforms from being held liable for things users say on them. And it touches on everything from, from election integrity to, to online social media bias, etc. In Australia, we, we also see action taking place. Australia is now vocalizing what it sees as, as a lacuna in, in not having the copyright regime, Europe put in place with its uh, digital single market reforms and it's finalizing a specific 
use media bargaining code to address level playing field issues between platform and platforms and publishers. And again, if, if there is an interest to, to comment more on what's going on there, uh, I'll be happy to do so in the Q&A. And finally, China. China is an important digital player. China is the second home of big tech. And they have opened an antitrust investigation on Alibaba on suspicion of monopolistic practices. And they're clearly willing to control the ambitions of the local big tech groups. And I could go on like that. In India, there's a big privacy push from, from the Modi administration, etc. But I'd like to, to come against that background to, to the, the third and last part of my, my comments. And this is a question of a global digital deal. I think it is worthwhile addressing that because like some of the main challenges faced at global level, climate, inequalities, the platforms are also global with perhaps a, a special case for China. And I think it's important to talk about the global digital deal also because the need to restore trust, autonomy and fairness is commonly, commonly shared in many parts of the world. I'm personally convinced that it would be beneficial to all parties to engage in a discussion to address jointly these common issues. And this goes beyond the fact that collective action is required because many countries cannot win individually. Such discussion should include defining roles, rights, and obligations for each set of parties. And I'm equally convinced that because of their central role, the platforms have a key part to play in that conversation. We need them around the table. We need them to engage. And at the same time, public authorities must ultimately remain the orchestrator of different actors, different systems, because only they are in charge of maximizing the general interest. And the new global regulatory order that I'm calling for must be shaped in a way that it does not jeopardize either innovation or convenience or connectivity access, but on the contrary, that it, it, it enhances these first, further for the common interest of all. And we need a deal, by the way, both on rules and on enforcement of the rules. Now you could challenge me and say, well, Bruno, you need two for Tango <laughs> and, and probably a much larger number for Bamba that is for a multilateral agreement. Mm. And you could also know that what I'm proposing would require that all partners who should ideally be involved be, be like-minded, at least on values, if not on policies as well. And that at this stage, you know, we are far from it and you'd probably be not be wrong in challenging me on that. Because if you look, for instance, US versus EU, the US privileged freedom of enterprise, that is short-term efficiency, while the EU is more concerned with contestability of markets, that is longer-term competition. The EU is also less skeptical about regulation in general and perhaps more skeptical about markets. Freedom of speech is the number one value in the US, while for the EU, it's one of the values to be privileged, but not at the, exp at the expenses of other values, preventing harm, for instance, which are equally important. And what about China's value when you compare China with EU or the US? You know, President Macron rightly pointed out recently that China is for the EU and, and probably also for the US, at the same time, a global partner. It's a global partner on climate. It's a competitor, it's a trade competitor, but it's also fundamentally a systemic rival with very different sets of views on democracy and, and human rights. Now, could those differences between the EU and its global partners prevent any progress towards a global digital deal? I don't think so. Of course, if the objective is to achieve one single super digital treaty within the framework of the UN or even just the G20, yes, this could 
legitimately be considered as a rather remote and even unrealistic objective. But in my view, making a number of gradual steps towards increasing bilateral and multilateral cooperation on specific aspects of the digital agenda is not unrealistic. And let me explain why. Even if the EU and the US values are not similarly weighed, the commonality of concerns and challenges should not prevent both parties and the companies based on both sides of the pond from moving forward with, for instance, the Commission's recent proposal on a transatlantic technology and trade council. This forum could be the right place to discuss a common approach to areas like AI regulation, platforms responsibility, or even as recently suggested by a major US-based tech player, the promotion of, of global data flows. On taxation, which is another important item of the global agenda, it's in the platform's interest that the ongoing discussions on a digital task, tax within the OECD framework eventually lead to an agreement on a unified system. Can you imagine the nightmare it would be for them if they were having to face the myriad of national situations, which in the absence of an OECD agreement are bound to emerge? Similarly, on several economic and non-economic regulation related issues, such as limits to the market power of platforms, to their liability, to content moderation, to transparency of algorithms, and probably many other sensitive topics. Is it unreasonable to think that the consensus around common principles could ultimately be identified at multilateral level? And perhaps a final word on data. International cooperation on data protection is key to establish a virtual circle of trust in the digital age. There is a way to have protection of individuals coincide with the protection of corporate interest. We need to encourage legal regimes that facilitate data transfers instead of fragmentation and digital protectionism, such as forced data localization requirements. It is in citizens' interests to have information circulate across frontiers, and it is in the interest of businesses to have cross-border data flows. And this requires data protection laws and traditional data privacy debates to evolve around a number of shared principles. And I know that progress on that front has already been achieved at the international level. I would just mention the Convention 108, which is the Council of Europe's Global Data Protection Convention. This is something which covers 55 countries, so much broader than Europe with Latin American, African, and, and Asian countries. It's a legally binding instrument that, that aims at creating a common global legal space for, for data protection in the, in the digital age. And I could also mention the, uh, here the, the negotiations on, on digital trade at the WTO level and their conclusions in the, in the near future should enhance data flows, provided of course that full compliance with the EU data protection framework can be guaranteed. To conclude, if we want to identify and then implement the most adequate policy and regulatory framework to make digital markets competitive, safe, fair and innovative and avoid the risk of having a splinter net, there is a need for a deep and constructive dialogue on a global basis. That dialogue should involve all stakeholders, governments, regulators, platforms, business users, citizens. It should be based on a robust analytical framework. It should overcome the traditional silo approach in our policy development and regulatory processes. It should acknowledge the regulatory implications of the variety of business models in the online economy. And it should be setting clearly each party's respective rights and obligations. And I think that in a realistic scenario, a global digital deal could take the form of a series of issue-specific bilateral and multilateral agreements between the EU third country partners and the economic agents involved. 
And this will necessarily be a gradual process, but it has to be initiated now. And I'm convinced that my proposals should contribute to implement Europe's determination to acquire strategic autonomy, which this commission has been rightly advocating in the last year. Europe has often been a role model in regulation. That's the so-called Brussels effect. A number of regulatory developments originated in the EU have paved the way to similar rules elsewhere in the world. The example of GDPR is well known. Now, one of the features of our approach, of the EU approach to regulation, is its coherence and its value-based dimension. In Europe, regulation is an essential pillar of our democratic architecture. It's a tool to safeguard the fundamental rights of European citizens. The explicit emphasis on a human-centric approach in the regulation of AI provides another illustration of this. Therefore, the sooner the EU will achieve a unified internal view on the regulatory proposals to address the platform economy challenges, and I'm referring here in particular to the DMA and the DSA, the sooner it will have the leadership necessary to shape global conduct and move closer to its strategic digital autonomy objectives. As it, and as it is the case with climate change, a lot of the risks is in global action being too slow and too late. So let's not waste time and let's respond to the needs of urgent solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bruno, for that uh, inspirational uh, presentation. I think it was very insightful and extremely clear because you're able to cover such complex issues, uh, but giving a framework to, uh, to work through them. I think this goes back maybe to your work in the London School of Economics in, in terms of your industrial relations. Uh, many years ago. <laughs> many years ago, but taking a gradual approach. I think it, it, it's very interesting. And we're honored to have you actually present this idea within this framework for a global uh, deal here. We, we've lots of questions coming in, as, as you can imagine. Um, and one of the um, first ones actually is from Peter McLoon, who was, who was involved in industrial relations, but is a board member of the IIEA. And he's looking, you've mentioned it, about the current struggle between big tech companies and the Australian government. Do you see that as part of the process, part of defining the issues? The, the, the Australian uh, developments are, are very interesting and they're very interesting at, uh, for several reasons. Um, I, I think we should first uh, clarify that what is taking place was originally a fight between Facebook and Google on the one hand and Rupert Murdoch's group, on the other hand, and Mr. Murdoch's group owns more than two thirds of the Australian daily newspapers market. And, and then the conflict uh, was uh, relayed by, by the government. Now, apart from that, it's clear that there is another issue, and, and, and that issue is, is about having uh, the platforms paying for, for the content uh, which has been created by uh, traditional media companies. Now, we've been through that in the EU, and sometimes we still face similar issues, but in the EU, the law mandates uh, payment for, for use of press contents. And this is obviously fundamental because access to quality news is critical to the well-functioning of our democracies. 
And perhaps a third remark I would make on that is that when we look at that from a, the Australian situation from a, from a global perspective, the, the fight between the Australian government and, and, and Facebook, Google, etc., is, is equally important because it forces to wonder whether small or, or medium-sized countries like Australia be able to impose their rules on the global platforms. Will the platforms simply be able to boycott smaller nations? And, and, and this is a key issue. And this is why I'm obviously a militant of EU-wide and also broader action. Let's be clear, Joyce, Luxembourg would never be able to, to, to regulate the tech giants itself because they would simply leave if they didn't like the rules. And just thinking of an additional point, the situation may be the same with, with other EU member states with a high dependency on big tax tax revenues. Yes. They may prefer the EC to regulate on their behalf. And I suppose I don't need to mention any example here. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Bruno. Um, we've got a question from Emily Binchy, and she asks, how would you quantify the success of the GDPR in terms of giving back control of personal data to the user? it is often difficult for platform users to identify its tangible benefits. That's a good question. Um, I, would make, I would make a difference between uh, the legislation itself and the way it's being enforced. Because I think we have a a great legislation and we have clearly been pioneered in developing it and as I said uh, we've been role models California has been following us etc and, and other parts of the world but the question about GDPR raises our attention to the issue of enforcement mm -hmm. We could be, we could do better in terms of enforcement. When when we look at the at the records of enforcement, EU versus the US in the area of, of, of privacy, we see that the enforcement focus of the US is is much more convincing, even if they're not the first in the, in the class in terms of developing the appropriate legislation. I've seen recently figures showing that the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, has had since uh, 2018 imposed almost $6 billion in privacy fines, including heavy penalties on, on some of the largest tech players. Now, do you know that during the same period, despite the fact that we are the pioneers with GDPR, mm -hmm. we have just collected less than 300 million euros on, 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 privacy, uh, uh, on privacy fines. Now, to be honest, it, it is not clear to me that uh, the, the US record has led uh, to more significant changes in the conduct of the firms that have been fined. But uh, this is why uh, in, in CER, my with my colleagues, uh, we, we have in our proposals an, an assessment on, on the DMA and, and, and the DSA, uh, we have made a number of recommendations on oversight, on, on an ecosystem of on oversight. And, and mm. Perhaps I, I, could, I could mention yes. a number of, of common principles because I think this is, this is a key part. Uh, 
we came up with in our, in our recommendations with oversight being defined by you know, effectiveness, proportionality, openness, due process, respect of uh, fundamental rights, innovation friendliness, and also the fact that the regulators must experiment. We, we are on moving sands, so we must have the regulators must have the possibility to 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 experiment, and uh, and this should be of course implemented by independent regulators. Uh, uh, in my country, for instance, today there are still a number of uh, 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 issues around the the independence and the accountability of the privacy regulators. Uh, and I think this is something where, as I said, we we must have, we must make progress. Well, Bruno, do you, do you think that the DMA and SNA proposals give that framework? Are you suggesting that that's what's lacking? We 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 think that uh, you know the uh, it's a good start. We see we see a number of good proposals in the DMA and the DSA. Uh, but on on uh, on implementation, uh, as well uh, as on other aspects of the DMA or the DSA, uh, we say it's a good start. But it's not the end of the process, and and, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that uh, within the the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers, uh, these proposals will still or can still be be improved, improved and amended. To address those issues, yeah, within the the normal yeah. trilogue process, the classical trilogue process. Um, we've got a question here from Nicholas Suzuki from the Trade Advisor at the International Trade Intelligence and Associated Researcher at the Jacques Delors Institute, and he asked the question: What prospect do you see for the WTO Joint Statement Initiative in Electronic Commerce becoming the global digital deal? That you envisage. I don't know the details of what your your view was ask, is asking, but I would I would say that uh, the, what I'm what I've been advocated advocating is is clearly uh, is is not going to be the result of as I said one uh, uh, one initiative. It's it's a number of initiatives which will gradually converge. And, and if uh, that uh, initiative uh, mentioned by my uh, uh, distinguished colleague from, from the Jacques Delors Institute, uh, well, maybe. Good. Yeah. You mentioned um, uh, the UK. Could you briefly outline some differentiating features of the EU and the UK approaches to regulation on the online economy? Yeah, this is interesting because, you know, the the UK has, has long said that it's determined, and Prime Minister has said that that he wanted the UK to be, I quote, the the safest place in the world to be online. Uh, and 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 simultaneously, hot on on the heels of Brexit, uh, the UK, as we know, emphasised that it's open for business. So there's an additional element that, 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 that UK consumers uh, have been early adopters of, of new digital innovations in Europe. That is a, a reality. And, and I think it is therefore not surprising that uh, the UK's approach for, for keeping digital markets contestable looks set to, to focus on uh, high level principles. And uh, I must say that I share the views of, of several colleagues of mine who see the, the UK approach as more nimble because less pres prescriptive than, than the DMA. Uh, uh, because of, of this, uh, this approach on, uh, based on, on, on high level principles. And I'm also encouraged and, 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 and seduced to some extent uh, by the, the UK vision 
on enforcement uh, because they uh, they propose the and, and I think it is confirmed now uh, that they're going to create a new digital markets unit. Hmm. While, as I said, uh, the issue of enforcement by the Commission of the DMA is still something uh, which which is not too clear. Where are, for instance, the 80 or some uh, uh, people who are going to be uh, put in a new unit to deal with this? Are they going to be taken out, taken from, etc.? I don't want to enter into, into details, but there are a number of questions there. I'm not saying criticism, but question. questions. But do you think, as you've come back to this a number of times, do you think that this issue of enforcement can be addressed in the future through these various acts? Yeah, because I think I think it's 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 both uh, an issue of institutional design, okay, in, in making sure that things are being dealt with at the right level, and then of political will, because of course, if you decide that you want a member state of medium size to be the regulator of a large platform for all its operations in the EU, and that at the same time, you don't provide that regulator with the resources, financial, but human and, and, and skill resources to do that, you appreciate that there's an issue. Sure, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, we have a question from Mark Dempsey. Um, how do you see the structure of the digital services, digital services coordinators as proposed in the Digital Services Act legislation for each member state. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah. How do you foresee the structure of the digital services coordinators as proposed in the Digital Service Act legislation for each member state? Um, very yeah, well, specific. Uh, as, as I said, uh, for the moment, the, the, the Commission is, is, should become in the proposals uh, a kind of uh, uh, EU FTC. And uh, the, the, the question is about uh, whether there are going to be sufficient resources, independence, accountability. I don't have any problem with regard to independence if it's in the Commission. I don't have any problem regarding accountability because we live in a system of, of uh, accountability to both the parliament and the court. Uh, I may have questions about resources, as I said. Mm. Now, there is uh, also a, an internal question about uh, the synergies uh, with different powers, in particular, the, the antitrust and, uh, uh, and, and, and the DSA. Uh, is this going to be sufficiently clear and predictable? Uh, is there going to be a, a joint task force within the Commission services with the various services involved? Uh, connect, comp, grow, um, question. I, I, we see also, and this is something we, my, my, we, we've discussed in SER, uh, that there seemed to be in the Commission proposal a relatively limited role for, for national authorities um, in the Digital <coughs> Markets Advisory Committee. Um, we, we think that uh, these things have to be addressed at a national level, but within a in a, in a coordinated manner, but you cannot uh, expect a, a central body to uh, to deal with everything. But therefore, if 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 there is a kind of federalization, or this is not the word I should use, decentralization, <laughs> decentralization. Sorry, you know, uh, these are things that I could say forty years ago, but I can't in, anymore yeah. today. <laughs> Um, decentralization, uh, then you must ensure that there will be uh, 
a number of there will be common ways of you know putting up a complaint uh putting up measures what kind of measures what kind of remedies what kind of monitoring so clearly uh, this digital markets advisory committee is the place for, for that to be to be developed uh, but uh, not at the expenses of the uh, national authorities actual responsibilities for dealing with with cases thanks bruno now moving on to another area from seamus allen and the iiea what are your thoughts on the role of mandatory data sharing requirements as a tool to promote competition? It's a complicated issue. I, I, I think that um, we have to make the difference between, between personal data and, and, and industrial data. Uh, I, you hear sometime in Brussels, people saying we, we lost the fight around mm -hmm. personal data, but we must win the one on, uh, on industrial data. Mm. And I think on industrial data, the vision of the commission today, uh, the initiative of, uh, of, of Thierry Breton among others, uh, it is very clear. Uh, we must be the leaders and, and it's clear that having that free flow of data uh, is something but in a in a responsible and, and controlled way uh, is essential for europe to acquire its strategic autonomy now uh, does that mean that with regard to uh, personal data uh, the fight is is, is lost uh, i don't know uh, and I, I cannot I cannot accept that. I I don't know if you you may have heard and your viewers may have heard about uh, a vision of personal data sovereignty, which uh, is being promoted by Sir Tim Berners Lee. You know Berners Lee; he's yeah. the founder of the internet, mm -hmm. and he's advocating for a situation where every citizen would be given uh, a secure data store to serve as the home for their personal data with the ability to determine who has access to data within it mm. and, and when. I find this very uh, attractive. Now, is it just a utopia for the moment? I don't know, but it's clear that we need to move closer to the fact that we can decide when and to whom we are prepared to give our personal data. And this is what we expect and should be expected from regulation uh, to uh, provide for. Bruno, I think this is a good note to end on. Unfortunately, time has caught up on us. But I think, as I said, you've presented a, a vision, maybe a framework, to look at a, a, a global digital deal and the complexity of it. But as you said, you like things simple, uh, that it will be possible through gradual steps through uh, that digital agenda. And I suppose what's really encouraging now are the number of questions that can be asked and there's a framework in which to work through them. And the vision of Europe itself as a leader of making Europe digitally fit for purpose, for having the view of involving citizens, question equality, the rights and individuals, yet balancing that with platforms, with business, with other vested interests. So I thank you for, for raising those issues in a, in a way that is easily understandable, but also giving us a pathway to look at this issue, which I think, as you say, this global digital deal is on the agenda now, whether we like it or not. Regulation has been discussed and we have a way with people like you, with that leadership of helping us work through those issues within Europe and within the broader international community. So thank you very much 
And I'd like on your behalf to thank our audience for their active participation. Uh, very interested. We've lots of other questions, but unfortunately, we won't be able to get there. And to thank Lokan Mullally from the production team of the IIEA and Seamus Allen, our digital policy researcher. But really, Bruno, it's been a tour de force, a great privilege, as I said, to have you here. And thank you very much. And we look it was forward my pleasure. to thank you very thank much, you, Bruno. And we look forward to welcoming you again and maybe another time in Ireland this year. So thank you very much and goodbye to everybody and good keep well and stay safe. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye now. Bye.